Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. We well, you know today the United States has 350 million guns. This past June marks the 47th month in a row that has exceeded 1 million background checks in a single month for gun purchases. The simple fact is, no common sense gun control legislation will impact the availability of firearms in the foreseeable future. I personally think we need to have a discussion and better understanding of gun ownership. We're joining me in a conversation on the rights and responsibilities of gun ownership is Dan Cook, owner and instructor at Defensive Arms and Readiness Training. And Dan, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, you know, I have to, I guess, start <clears throat> with um, the disclaimer, the confession or what have you, um, that uh, I, I, I do have uh, firearms. Um, uh, more than one, as they say, uh, much to my mother's chagrin <clears throat> when I was very young, my grandfather bought me a BB gun and he taught me how to shoot. And, um, I enjoyed shooting targets. I've, I've never been a, been a hunter. And in fact, I was on the, uh, rifle team at Wake Forest University and of course, officer in the combat arms, uh, active duty and what have you. And so guns were certainly part of my life. Dad enjoyed buying, selling, and trading, built his different collection, and yes, some of the guns were always loaded, because as he would say, what good is an empty gun? That's kind of a joke. So I know that there's kind of a generational divide there, but I wanted to really see as I, I, I just think it's not so much about the Second Amendment, because people can have their opinions on that and should have that, have that and it becomes a, a political issue. But the fact of the matter is, the guns are gonna be there. And it seems to me that there's rights and responsibilities together as it goes to gun ownership. And that's what I would like for us to explore. Uh, when, before we get to some of the specifics, what are some of the reasons in your training, what have you, why do people say they bought a gun, they want a gun? Well, it's been my experience. Many of the, of the students that come to me, they come because of the unrest that you see today. Um, many people feel that they need to be better prepared, and part of that is gun ownership. What is better to fight a gun than another gun? That's part of the whole argument that you hear repeatedly played out is, why do you need this or that or what have you? There's an old saying that God created man and Samuel Colt made him equal. <laughs> because if, you know, the facts are, if, if a, a man or whatever is intent to do harm to someone, if you happen to be of lesser stature than that person that's attacking you, well, you're gonna level the playing field if you happen to have a gun. There are certainly some responsibilities that go with that. And a lot of people talk about the rights and responsibilities of gun owners and whatnot, but they're not mutually exclusive of one another. Every single thing that you do in your everyday life carries with it rights and responsibilities. And gun ownership is no different. You know, one of the things that uh, in preparing for our conversation, I tell you, 72% uh, of purchasers um, say the main reason is for safety. But boy, post-COVID, Americans went on a shopping spree. There was a 64% increase in gun sales in 2020, and majority went the first-time buyers, and half were women. And so I thought that that was kind of interesting that that COVID and that unrest of the 2020 really started um, a great deal in terms of the, of the gun purchases. Um, hunting is only accounts for about as a reason for about 32%. I also thought it was interesting looking at some of the ownership numbers. So 47% rural, 30% suburbs, 20% urban, and 46% men and 21% of gun owners are women. And so that's interesting. I'm not surprised about the rural breakdown, but indeed, to your point, the purchasing since 2020 has been so much uh, increased. Well, let's talk a little bit about the rights of gun ownership. We know that the laws differ in every state, but who can buy a gun in Virginia? Well, the short answer is, anybody that meets the age requirements and is not a prohibited person. The long answer is, because usually the next question is, what constitutes a prohibited person? Most people will think of, well, if you're a convicted felon, you're a prohibited person. 
Certainly, if you are a prior convicted felon, you can go through the legal means and have your rights restored. Generally, for that to happen for your firearm rights, that's a two-step process. Um, otherwise, if you are a dishonorably discharged military person, uh, that disqualifies you. Hmm. If you are uh, someone that has been mentally adjudicated, if you are someone um, that is under a, a domestic violence or restraining order, uh, that would make you um, a prohibited person. Um, much to your, to your point though about different laws or what have you, that's one of the things that's kind of one of the stumbling points for people with gun ownership is simply the fact that it's, it's not just state to state. It has now become something that is more involved than that. It's municipalities, localities, cities and townships. They can now pass their own set of gun laws. And so that makes it even harder for the responsible and the law abiding citizen to try to protect themselves. Um, do you need a permit to purchase a gun? You do not need a permit, but if you purchase a gun, you will have to undergo a background check. Do guns need to be registered in the Commonwealth of Virginia? Only if they're a machine gun or a short barrel rifle. There is no such thing as a gun registry. Um, let's talk about um, uh, carry um, kind of concerns. And let's start with concealed carry. Um, what are the elements of that? What does that mean in terms of concealed carry in the Commonwealth of Virginia? Concealed carry really is a nebulous kind of thing, if you will, because if you look what has happened over the past several years, there's this new thing that's been adopted. In fact, Nebraska is getting ready to come on as the 27th state that is going to adopt what's known as constitutional carry. That's kind of a misnomer. It's not really constitutional carry. If it was, it would be totally different, but it's more technically called permitless carry. So places like West Virginia, okay, Nebraska, as I said, is getting ready to come on as a 27th state. You don't, so long as you're not a prohibited person and you are over 21 years of age, you can carry a gun whether you have a permit or not. You don't have to have a permit. A lot of people get themselves into trouble because they think, well, we'll use a, a neighboring state, if you will, West Virginia. West Virginia is a permitless carry state now. A lot of people in West Virginia have this thought that, well, since West Virginia and Virginia has the act of reciprocity, which Virginia has reciprocity with about 35 different states, that says that if you have a concealed weapons permit from the state of Virginia, these other states will honor that. There are some minor differences between the two that you should be aware of, but let's talk about Virginia and West Virginia specifically. I get a lot of questions about this from some of our neighboring states because if you are under the guise of permitless carry that you think, well, Virginia and West Virginia have reciprocity, no, that's not right. You, that doesn't mean that you can carry, concealed carry in Virginia since you're from West Virginia. You still have to have a concealed weapons permit from your state in order to be recognized in the state of Virginia. Well, now with concealed carry in Virginia, does it permit, does it require competency? In other words, must I demonstrate or prove competency in getting a concealed permit? Virginia, there is an educational requirement. That was changed a couple of years ago. It used to be you could do uh, a class online, but they started cracking down on that because they found that there were some people that they would have little brother Joe or their uncle Bob or whatever take the test for them online. Well, this way they changed it a couple of years ago that said, no, it has to be an in-person class. So long as you pass that in-person class, then you can fill out what's known as an, an SP-248 that you can get from the Virginia State Police website, fill that out and go take your fees to, you know, the, the court clerk, pay your fees. And f as of now, we are still known as a shall issue state. So, so long as you're not a prohibited person, like some of the ones that we talked about earlier, they will issue you a concealed weapons permit. And so a test written what about on the range? Must I demonstrate competency that I can shoot, know how to shoot, load, using safety kinds of measures? You can, but it's not a requirement. 
Okay, like let's talk about the ones that are in North Carolina. In North Carolina, you have to attend an eight hour class. They talk about the laws, they talk about different things, the safety aspects, the range safety and all of this. And they also have a competency where you have to, to perform a live fire drill. They also do that in the state of Illinois and a number of other states in and around. Um, Virginia is not like that. Virginia, you have to go undergo a safety class at a bare minimum. And by and large, the, the vast majority of people that come to me, that's what, they're, that's what they're seeking. You can take a basic pistol class in which there is a live fire component to that, but it's not a requirement. Um, and if you have concealed carry, and I know it can differ where airports know, city buildings, university campuses perhaps, what about restaurants? Must they have a sign to prohibit it? Or if they don't have a sign prohibiting it, can you enter a restaurant with a, a concealed carry? Yes, you can. There used to be a law that said that you could not carry a concealed firearm within the premises of any place that served alcohol. A few years ago, they changed that, but the addendum to that is that if you start consuming alcohol, now you're breaking the law. You can carry into a restaurant that serves alcohol, but you cannot drink. So let's say that um, I was going to transport guns and I do not have a concealed carry. Um, can I lay them in the back seat or something? I mean, in other words, can I transport guns from a resident to somewhere else without breaking the law? Yes, you can. The, the only thing is they have to be unloaded and they have to be stored securely. So just laying on the back seat's not stored securely then? If it's out of reach, then it's, it should be wrapped or stored securely. It could be in the back seat or, or in a trunk, but so long as it's unloaded, that's the big thing. Well, talk uh, a moment. Under what conditions can I use a gun for self-protection in the Commonwealth of Virginia? To protect your personal safety or that of a loved one or someone that you feel is in fear of death or severe bodily injury. We hear people talk about the castle laws or what have you. Uh, would you help us understand that? Uh, the Castle Doctrine, which to the best of my knowledge, certainly I'm not, a, I'm not a lawyer, I've never been one, I've never played one on TV, but to the best of my knowledge, the Castle Doctrine is more so to, um, it fits around you in your domicile, where you, your home. Um, Virginia is what is known as a, um, there is no duty to retreat. So the, the big thing with that is you cannot be a party to the fray. In other words, if you started, if you antagonize it or you're part of it, then you have to get away. You, you have to leave, okay? Now, if that person chases you or what have you, you've now entered into the fray again, but you weren't part of it that brought it about yourself. So uh, there's a big misconception in the state of Virginia that you can shoot someone to protect property and you can't that's a big misconception you cannot you cannot use deadly force to protect property so if somebody's stealing your car you know what that's what the insurance is for they'll get you another car but they're not going to get you 10 or 15 years back of the time that you spent in prison mm -hmm. well let's go to some of the responsibilities and i guess the first responsibility i guess of ownership is to know the laws right i mean that seems but the laws change every year so i mean you conscientiously, that should be the first factor, I'm assuming. That is a big part of it. And, and just about every one of the students that I have, that is one of the biggest concerns, is because it is, it's like navigating a minefield. As soon as you know or you think you know one thing, another law is brought into place. And the old adage of ignorance is no, no excuse, mm -hmm. that would certainly come to bear on you. It is up to you to know what the rights and responsibilities are if you're gonna undertake this. And I'm assuming that second would be training of some sort. What types and kinds of training that is available that you even offer that is helpful for gun owners? Well, some of the things that I offer are, of course, the basic home firearm safety course. I can also do simulated pistols. I can do a basic pistol. I offer basic home defense. Um, really, the main thing is that people, <laughs> I jokingly say in, in my classes that I don't have a whole lot of men 
that come to the class because they were born knowing everything. <laughs> so some of that, there is some truth to that, but there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of things that people really should take into account. And one of those things is I also teach a class called Refuse to be a Victim. Refuse to be a victim, much like the home firearm safety course, is a non-live fire course. It doesn't really deal with anything of doing with guns, handguns, or what have you. It's more about situational awareness. If you go to the mall nowadays and you sit and you watch people, mm -hmm. invariably you will see a very target-rich environment with all of these people. And you know, my son is one of the biggest you know, offenders, I would think. If you watch him, it's this. They don't have any idea of what's going on outside of their little sphere that is two feet around them. And that is one of the things that I think people really should take grasp of and, and really kind of take that home with them, is you really have to understand situational awareness and be aware and be watchful of what's going on around you. Where are the exits? All the, it's, it's not just about sitting in the gunfighter seat and knowing, you know, oh, we're well, watching everybody that comes in. It's a lot more involved than that. The best thing that I can tell people to do is, is to make and think through things before they actually happen. I used to be involved in Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts. I was a scout leader and held many, many positions for years and years. And what I used to tell my adult leaders was, the biggest thing that you have to do is you have to step three steps in front of these kids. You have to anticipate what they're going to do. And when that happens, you have to have already thought about what your response is going to be. A pre-canned set of decisions that you've already thought about is going to go a long way in helping to protect you and your loved ones. If you borrow the old adage from Mr. Spock, when you become emotionally compromised, I will almost guarantee you every single time that the decision you make under stress will be vastly different than a decision that you might make in a conversation such as you and I are having right now. Mm -hmm. So what would be your advice to someone who has the basic, whether it's concealed or not, but they have uh, uh, weapons, should you, what, yearly, every three months, six months? I mean, should you routinely go and practice uh, with the firearm to continue to familiarize yourself with one? Well, certainly shooting is a perishable skill. Once you get to a certain level, you can drop off and it doesn't take you as long to get to perhaps that same level. It might take you, people, People are different in and of themselves. Some people can pick up a firearm and they're very good with it from the onset. Others, not so much. I see this a lot in the home firearm safety class where people have a hard time manipulating slides and racking different things and it's because they're just not exposed to it. It's something that's completely new to them. I tell people it's like the, the hardest thing to deal with when you begin this road, this journey, is because you don't know what you don't know. Mm. And it takes a little bit of time to get to it. But more so to your point, yes, a firearm is nothing more than a tool. It doesn't do anything by itself. It's an inanimate object. And if you don't use, learn how to use it and use it properly and continue to hone those skills, things are not gonna go as you plan them. Matter of fact, I saw one study in preparing for a conversation that made it very clear that without training, you know, you're not better protected with a firearm if you don't have the requisite training and skill set because it could lead to injuries and what have you. And so um, to have a weapon and not train or have different um, training opportunities and practicing does not make you uh, in and of itself safer. There is a, a, a certain amount of truth to that, but I think it would be remiss to say that, you know, certainly the 71 year old grandmother in a wheelchair that's being attacked by somebody that comes into their house and to do bad, they're going to have a lot more chance against that person than mm. if they didn't have a gun. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's one of the things that when people start throwing away a lot of the statistics and they talk about all this stuff, it, they're not looking at the complete picture. 
I think that's one of the big parts that's being, being overlooked in that conversation. Well, now let's say that you uh, are a parent and you have children. What do you consider the minimal kind of obligations of responsible gun ownership if you have children in your house? Well, it's not exactly a minimum uh, responsibility, if you will. It's set forth by law. If you are found to essentially have a, a reckless attitude towards firearms and a child gets a hold of it, um, then you're responsible. Um, we have seen that recently in the six-year-old that, that shot his teacher in Virginia Beach. Okay? That is part of that. Part of the, hand, the handgun safety uh, training that we go through, we talk about a family safety plan. And it's very, very important to discuss those things. And it's not meant to be a static thing or a one size fits all. It's things that, that kind of grow and they're gonna be dynamic because you know, I've gone through the whole gamut of you know, a small child in the house. Uh, now my son is 21 years old, but now I also have a five-year-old grandson. Mm -hmm. So it is a situational thing to where it's a little bit different. The biggest issue that I try to uh, get across to my students is that you not only have to know what you're shooting at, but you have to know what's on the other side of what you're shooting at. You have to be concerned, especially in a home defense type of environment, in overpenetration through the walls. Mm -hmm. What's on the other side of that wall? When I have my grandson staying at the house and my son is not there, I don't have to worry too much about somebody coming into the door at one o'clock in the morning and thinking, well, is that my son or is that whatever? If you come into my house at one o'clock in the morning, you're probably not supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be different for everyone and they have to think through all of those things. And I guess it's just, and I hate to use the word common sense, but I'm, I'm assuming that trigger locks make a lot of sense gun safes make a lot of sense. Is, would you recommend those? There is a, there's a number of ways in which you can secure a firearm. And a lot of people think that securing a firearm means, as you said, putting it in a safe or a gun cabinet. There's other ways that you can do it. And they're very simply with, say, if you have a revolver, very simply take a, uh, a padlock or some other lock and put it through the upper bar of the, of the you've now rendered that gun inoperable. You can't use it. Um, take the slide off, put it in the drawer, what have you. I mean, we all know that four and five year olds can be very inquisitive and they're very good at climbing, um, but they're not so good at putting guns back together. I agree with the fact that, you know, we, we can have this disingenuous uh, argument that, well, if you get rid of all of the guns, we'll get rid of all the gun violence. Well, that's a disingenuous kind of a debate because if you got rid of all of the guns, well, of course you'd get rid of all of the gun violence. But that's the same thing as saying, well, if you got rid of all of the cars, you'd get rid of all of the, the, the highway deaths. Mm -hmm. But you'd have an awful lot of other things that you'd have to be concerned with on top of that. There's a number of the trigger locks. Um, I sell a lot of the, the gun safety um, car, what we call car safes or car vaults. Mm -hmm. I sell a lot of those. Really, it's more so a thing of your, your buying time, more so than anything else. So. Um, I find it interesting that technology, like in so many ways, may be on the horizon. A smart gun, um, there's a, Color, Colorado has a, a company called Biofire, and it's the first biometric smart gun for the market where it can be just to you in terms of your thumb holding or what have you. And that would certainly go a long way in protecting because only you as the owner can even make it work. So that's an interesting role of technology. There is an interesting concept to that, but I think we are many, many, many years away from any kind of a legitimate uh, solution to that. Uh, one of the things that California started, I think in 2013, it started around 2010, um, they said that you, it had, you, if you purchased a handgun, it had to be on a safe gun registry. Um, and for example, if you, their thing was the, the gun that was firing had to be able to do a micro stamp two times on the shell casing. That technology is not even, it, it wasn't viable back then and it's still not viable. There's, there's no, really no way to do it. Um, I'm not saying that those kind of things are not 
something that can be of use in the future, but we're nowhere near that now. Well, we're literally uh, only have a minute left. I wanted to give you that uh, final 40 seconds or so to what would you communicate about the rights and responsibilities, summing it up at a 40,000 foot view? Well, one of the worldview, I think, is one of those things that you really have to look at things. There, there's all kinds of rights and responsibilities to go with. It's, it's, that's no different than driving a car. That's no different than driving a bicycle or a boat or a skateboard. But I think that one of the things that really has to be looked at is the number of defensive uses of a handgun or a firearm in general in the course of a year. There was a study that came out not too long ago that said that their estimate was 1.67 million uses of a defensive use of a handgun that stopped a robbery or stopped a murder or what have you. That's an awful lot of instances. If you break it down per day, that's over 4,500 a day. Mm -hmm. Well, believe it or not, that's all the time we have. I, I want to thank my guest, Dan Cook, owner and instructor of defensive arms and readiness training for joining me. And as always, I want to thank you for joining me and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.